Thank you so much for joining us for this Black Hills Information Security webcast. We do them every week, and starting next week, we'll only be doing webcasts on Thursdays, which means if you have been attending Wallace Hackenfest or Anti-Siphon or Active Countermeasures, uh, we're only going to do them on Thursdays. And if you're like, how do you all coexist? We're all owned by the same people, John Strand and Eric Strand. So that's how it works. So Ben's going to be here to talk about how bartending made me a better InfoSec consultant. Ben, thank you so much. I will be here just in case something bad happens uh, or to ask questions if we need to. Uh, but other than that, I'll see you at the Q&A at the end. Oh, that's all yours, Ben. Cool. Thanks. Um, hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Ben. This is a talk on how bartending hypothetically made me a better information security consultant. This is my introduction slide with this beautiful warm bar. I found this picture on Google. Um, I do not know where this bar is. I wish I did. I would like to go there because it looks very inviting and very cozy. But alas, I do not. Uh, so a quick agenda for the day, just kind of what we're going to try and go over in the, in the course of the talk. Um, why is this important? Who am I even to talk about this type of stuff? I'm starting off on the right foot with client engagements, and we're going to talk about kind of timelines a little bit too. Uh, the idea of managing meeting and ideally, if we can, exceeding expectations during the course of client engagements. Um, owning mistakes, being proactive about things that go wrong, trying to you know take the bull by the horns and make things right and, and own up when things go wrong because things always go wrong. Closing out projects and kind of what that means and what that looks like and making sure that we're also doing that on the right foot. And then I'll also kind of talk a little bit about transferable skills, um, things that I think I took away from my time in the service industry and not working in you know, consulting that helped me be a better consultant these days, and maybe some brief ideas for how people can try and get better at those things without having to go get a bar job while you're working in InfoSec as well. So who am I? My name is Ben. There's my Twitter handle. I don't really post anything, so don't feel obligated to follow, but it exists and there it is. I kind of go back and forth some days about like wanting to be famous and cool on Twitter, but also not wanting people to know that I exist out there in the world. So do with that information what you will. Um, I live in Chicago, Illinois. I'm a tester at uh, Black Hills Information Security. I've been here since about last September or so. So I'm not sure how many months that is, but since then. Um, before that, I was a tester at a company called Evolve Security here in Chicago. So I've been consulting and pen testing for about five or six years now. Some of the cool things that I've worked on um, APT state sponsored compromise, um, instant response project that took up a whole summer. That was a very stressful introduction to working in security. Uh, things like fortune 25 office, 365 cloud security audits, um, adversarial emulation, purple team testing, and all kinds of pen tests in between, you know, web apps, internals, externals, small, large startups, enterprise companies, and kind of everything along the way. Things that I enjoy iced tea. It's one of my favorite beverages of all time. Uh, unsweetened. I grew up in the South, so I kind of came up on it sweetened, but these days just unsweetened is the way to go. Mechanical keyboards. Uh, currently, my work keyboard is a, is a Rama with some Zelio switches. I know everyone at tech loves to geek out about their keyboards. I got into running a couple years ago. Um, I ran my first race last summer, which is a 5K, and I'm kind of currently in the process of working up to maybe doing a half marathon in the fall, but we'll see. And then Louise, this is my, my and my partner's newly adopted, retired racing greyhound. It kind of freaks me out coming out of the living room sometimes to see her upside down like this. But greyhounds have like weird tension in their spines because of how they run and just kind of how their bodies are shaped. So that's really comfortable for them to be laying upside down. It's kind of helping them stretch and relax. And it always unnerves me, but she loves to sleep like this. So that being said, how did I get here? What brought me to where I'm at now on this talk and being in front of all of your faces and on your screens today. So like a lot of people in tech or like a lot of people in security, I've got a bit of a non-traditional background, um, which is one of the cool things about security. I truly believe that those non-traditional backgrounds that everyone has really adds additional context and flavor and color to the way that people do their jobs and new insights into the way that things are done and generally like, you know, makes it a, a more well-rounded field and provide more, well, more well-rounded and, and better value for engagements. Uh, but initially, I went to school for computer sciences at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign for college in 2004. I was, suffice it to say, woefully unprepared for what a college experience was, um, living away from home for the first time. Uh, failed out almost immediately within the first year or so. After that, I had always been interested in photography. My dad was also really big into photography. So 
I messed around with some arts classes and ended up doing some some gen ed stuff at a community college in Urbana-Champaign. And then I moved up to Chicago in 2007 to study photography at Columbia College, Chicago. Once I finished studying photo, I did what most of my other friends that went to art school ended up doing after art school and getting a job in the service industry uh, to try and pay bills. I started off as a food runner. I worked as a server for a long time, but what was really exciting to me was the idea of, of helping to contribute and build things and make things. And so I wanted to become a bartender and make the drinks that I was selling instead of just kind of dropping things off and, and talking to guests. After that, I took a boot camp program. I had, you know, I hit 30. I was getting tired of working late nights. Um, I wanted some stability. And I ran into a friend that was actually a regular at one of the bars that I worked at. He works for Kenna. They got bought by Cisco not too long ago, but I ran into Michael and I was like, you know, I'm interested in getting back into tech. What do you think I should do? I had looked into like systems, you know, web development and things like that, you know, but he suggested security. He had some friends that had started a boot camp, So that was when I first started kind of looking into the idea of information security is in 2017. I ended up attending a boot camp um, and was lucky enough to get hired pretty, pretty shortly thereafter. I had finished that boot camp and kind of thrown into the world of consulting. And it was great. I, I was happy. I, was, I wasn't playing a bar anymore. I had normal hours. You know, I didn't have people staring at me all the time. Um, I didn't have to be on my feet all the time. It was great. Consulting was a lot of fun. It's still a lot of fun. I don't think it was necessarily what I expected it to be in a lot of ways, but I'm happy that I do it. My initial thoughts once I started testing were, this is, this is great. Working, working on pen tests is great. You know, there's so many cool tools. There's so much to learn. I think one of the things that really draws people to this field is the fact that no one knows everything, right? There's always more that you can learn. No one is a master in every domain. Um, and for someone like me that's really driven to, to keep learning and keep you know, pushing myself to, to learn new things and develop professionally, there's no shortage of places for me to do that in this field. But one of the things that really surprised me is I still had to talk to people. And the reason that I kind of quit bars is I didn't want to talk to people anymore. I'm not, <laughs> this might surprise you. I, I'm really not an extroverted person. I'm incredibly introverted. I'm quiet. I grew up reading books, playing games. I think social skills that I do have when it comes to talking to people that I don't know were very much informed and forced upon me by having to work these types of service industry jobs. And to a certain extent, when you're talking to people that you don't know all night for eight hours straight, that, that gets really draining. And I was incredibly surprised with how much I still needed to communicate with other people once I started consulting. And that's, you know, communicating with coworkers, managing up, working with managers, working with peers, managing down, working with clients, managing expectations. All of these things um, were much more prevalent than I think I anticipated there being. And also writing reports. You know, I think everyone wants to hack things. Everyone wants to break things. It's cool. It's fun. It's challenging. It's like playing a weird, complicated video game, but you know we have to document all that stuff. And the clients don't care what we do or how we do it if we don't write it up in a report and give them something that adds value to their organization that they can use to bolster their security posture. And then also delivering those reports, doing debrief calls, getting on a call with people that have been doing you know, IT for 10, 15, 20 years and giving a report about what you did on a test. For me specifically, you know, after I'd been doing this for like a year, that was still incredibly intimidating. To stand up in front of these people that had been doing this longer than I had been in this field by margins and say, this is what you're doing wrong. This is how you can do better. And a lot of those people knew things that I didn't know. So that was a really intimidating thing and trying to figure out and navigate how to do that effectively, how to not be intimidated by that kind of process and kind of taking ownership and authority of the work that you did and how you deliver it was, was a really big change that I didn't see kind of having to deal with. So why did I come up with this talk? Um, why do I think this is important? Well, first and foremost, um, I think consulting and bartending at the end of the day are both service, service jobs, right? When you work in bars or restaurants, they call it the service industry. When you work for you know, a pen test or consulting firm or some other you know, type of organization like that. You're called an MSP, like a managed service provider. So at the end of the day, we're, we're performing a service for our clients, right? So that means the clients that we work with are the ones that are dictating what we do and how we do it. And they're the ones that are paying us. With that in mind, like the deliverables are probably the most important part of what we do, right? You know, if you're working behind a bar, the deliverables are food and drink. That's why they're coming. That's why they're paying you. That's what they expect to get. If you're working in consulting, that's an actual report that the client's going to get at the end of a project. And what we want to do is we want to try and make those the best deliverables that we can, right? So 
if you're bartending and you have a guest come in, like you want to do absolutely everything you can to help them figure out just the perfect glass of wine for their meal, the perfect cocktail for their palate, what they're interested. You want to provide them the best experience and give them the absolute best product that you can. Um, I think the same thing is true of consulting, right? We don't just want to turn in like a generic report. We want to try and understand what's the business context of this client. Like how is how is this report going to be used? What are they going to do with this report? What do they need out of this report? How can we make that report that we deliver and turn in provide as much value as possible for the people that are paying us? In addition to like that final product that we're handing off at the end of an engagement, the experience along the way is, is just as important, right? It goes without saying that recurring clients are the best. You know, I can't tell you how many clients I've worked with, both here and at previous organizations that you know, have been clients for multiple years. And getting to know those clients, like seeing the people on those teams grow is amazing and awesome. Um, those people leave and go to different organizations. You run into them again at different jobs when they're working with different clients. And being a part of helping an organization's security posture grow and bolster over that amount of time and knowing that the work that you're doing is contributing directly to that and then going back and testing again two years later and actually seeing the change in the network that you've helped implement by doing work with that client is a really rewarding relationship. Also, it's cheaper. You know, it's cheaper to have recurring clients than it is to go out and find new ones. And those clients, if they have a good experience, they tell their friends. And that word of mouth helps you get even more clients, right? The, so that experience along the way is super important. And we've all had bad experiences, you know, on both sides of the equation, right? We've all worked with clients that are difficult to work with and clients that we don't want to work with again. And we've all turned in or had experiences where, you know, the quality of work that we wanted to turn in hasn't been as high as we wanted, or the you know problems that you encountered during the course of testing and the course of the engagement aren't what you want to see either. And those things happen. But um, I think the important thing to take away from those bad experiences is understanding what we can learn from those, how we can be better, and ways that we can you know always be improving. So I think being open to constructive criticism and feedback in the world of consulting is absolutely necessary. And I put a little shout out here to my therapist. I think one of the greatest things that anyone can do for their mental health, especially in a fast-paced world like information security and consulting, is finding a good therapist because that will change your life. CJ's popping on. Yeah. So Ben, this is so I, I love the parallel because like you're right, the, the the service is is everything, right? And mm-hmm. you, you've got to have the solid food and drink to go with it. But so talk about um so you're talking about things managing expectations. We talk about that, but when things go wrong, like how does a client, you know, get the best out of you? Yeah. Um, there's a side about that a little bit later, but I think getting ahead of mistakes is super important. And I'll, I have an analogy from like, you know, working at a bar. So say theoretically, I'm serving a guest, they order a burger. I know in the back of my head, that burger should probably come out in 10 to 12 minutes, right? I'm kind of con- unconsciously timing that in the back of my head. It gets around minute, like nine or 10 I look over, see that the burger is still not there. So there are two things you can do, right? You can wait and just hope the burger comes out eventually, or you can be proactive and go back and check in with the kitchen and say, hey, I'm still waiting on this burger. What's the holdup? Then go back to the customer and say, hey, you know, I know it's been a minute on your burger. I just went back, back and checked. It's going to be out, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. But being proactive about owning up to what's going on and trying to fix that before it becomes a problem, before the customer has to flag you down and say, hey, where's my burger? That goes leaps and bounds towards like making that situation smoother than it, than it probably could have been otherwise. Yeah. The, the commonality in good service, like yours is very much more abstract. Like you're very remote, right? You're not in front of the customer, mm-hmm. um, but in some ways that creates additional challenges. Um, so for us, like you're, you're, you're an awesome example kind of for our testers. We're not always just looking for the most technical wizardly genius in the world. We got a couple of those. It's this balance of the, the human skills. And even though you're an introvert, you're pretty good at this. Just like the <laughs> picture of you at the bar, right? Like you can play the role, but that is just so critically important. And I think it almost every every realm of business. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, no, I agree. I think there's a lot of people that are technical wizards, but I think if you're not able to communicate that wizardry to other people in a way that they can understand and digest and act on, then I think a lot of that gets lost. And I've seen, you know, I've been in positions where we've hired people that also haven't been as technically competent or skilled as others, but they present well, you know, they, they know how to communicate, they know how to show up, they know how to like be empathetic and, you know, do the work. And I think all of that stuff is, is very important. I think you're right to like all aspects of business, essentially. Yeah, 
and then BB will chime in with you there too. That the the, the service is the damn report. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's it's nice that you serve it with a smile and on time, um, but the content of the report. But I'll let you roll on. I appreciate it. So, what are some of the the realities of consulting? And another thing that kind of led me to come up with this type of presentation. And I know BB's got a really fantastic series of videos on what reporting is and what makes reporting amazing and great and how to do reporting well. But I think there are tons and tons of resources for technical learning, right? There are tons of things like hack the box, like all of OFSEC stuff. There's certificates left, right, and center. There are a million ways that you can go bolster your skills technically and learn new skills and, and exploit new vulnerabilities and, and all those sorts of things. But I don't know, and I granted, I haven't necessarily directly looked for them, but I don't know how many resources exist for becoming a better consultant in general or a better communicator in general, or some of these much more abstract things that are, as CJ mentioned, vastly important to doing business. And we, I think we spend a lot of time and get really rabbit holed on like the technical side of things. And I think taking a moment to step, you know, step back and understand like the greater context of what we're doing it and how we're doing it can ultimately make us better consultants and, and better professionals in general. As BB will also be quick to say that the hacks are cool. The clients don't really care if you don't report on it. They don't care if you don't effectively communicate and report on it. The impact of all of your work is vastly diminished if you turn in a subpar report. Uh, the impact of your work is also probably vastly diminished if you are hard to deal with in the client's perspective during the course of that engagement. Um, and all of those things impact like their general perception of how it was to work with you and whether or not they will again in the future. So I kind of wanted to talk about like the general cadence of testing. And this is just kind of what we do. I know everyone's kind of kind of does it differently, but this is what I've done in the past and what we kind of do here. But the general cadence that I'm involved with as a tester um, starts off with a kickoff call or an ROE call with the client where we kind of talk about what's going to happen, what tests we're going to do, how we're going to do them, things like that. After that, the testing happens, you know, all the hacking, all the reporting in between. And then lastly, we're finishing and delivering a report and then doing some sort of debrief or readout call. So that's kind of like the beginning and end life cycle of what an engagement looks like for consultants. So with that being said, we'll kind of jump into a little bit more about how that life cycle works. Um, so I think things that I learned in the bar, specifically when it comes to that kind of life cycle of the beginning and end of service, the two most important times when you go out for drinks or dinner are being initially greeted and when you're welcomed into a space. Right. I can't tell you how many times, and I'm sure you all have experienced something like this too, where you show up to a bar or restaurant. It's obviously very busy. There's a host stand, there's no one there. You're just kind of standing, chilling, waiting. What happens if no one shows up for 10, 15 minutes? Right. Like, how does that, how does that impact and color your perception of what that evening is like? It's like, yeah, maybe we had a good time, but like, I don't know, it was just weird when we walked in, we kind of hung out, we didn't know where to go. Do we see it ourselves? Like, what's the deal? So, that initial kind of greeting when you walk into a space, I think, is incredibly important to kind of set the tone for the experience that you're going to have. And similarly, paying your bill and being thanked and leaving is kind of closing that experience off and, and rounding it out, right? Like how many times have you had a really fantastic meal? You know, food was great. Service was great. Drinks were great. You got dessert. You got an after dinner cocktail. You finished your dessert. You finished your drink. You haven't seen your server in a minute. You finished your water. You know, at a certain point, you have nothing left on the table to consume, and you're just kind of hanging. If that server doesn't come back and drop off a bill promptly, like you're just kind of chilling, waiting for that, and that can have a, a super detrimental effect on like your overall experience, right? Like you had a great time up until that point, but all of a sudden you kind of hit a wall, and you're waiting 10, 15, 20 minutes just to be able to pay and leave because you don't have anything left in front of you to to kind of enjoy. So I think those are kind of like analogies for, you know, going out to a restaurant and the beginning of an end. And I mentioned already, but when it comes to consulting, those two important touchstones are the kickoff call with the client and then the report readout and delivery. I've got a quote here from the Milk and Honey Service Manual. This was a bar in New York City that closed uh, forever ago. It was Sasha, I forget his last name, Sasha something's bar. But just kind of the concept of, of, looking at a, a client or understanding a client and trying to meet and present needs. It's always better to anticipate those needs than it is for the client or the guest to have to ask you and flag you down to, to have those needs met. So that's something just to try and keep in mind in general. And I like, I like to think that they're the two most important because the other ones are still important. You know what the important ones are? Every interaction you have, mm -hmm. right? And then yeah, it's every interaction. And then having the right number and frequency, right? Because we've all had the server where it's too much. <laughs> and we've all had 
too little. It's like, so then it's an art of just right. So, yeah, it's it's a hard medium to find. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, there's an art to it. We always say, we always talk around here about the science and the art. Yeah. And even, even on the soft skill side, there's oh, no yeah. formula. Absolutely. Right? There's no script for that. So. And, and every, every engagement is different. Every client's going to be different too, right? You're going to have those clients yeah. that are super needy. They want 9 a.m. stand-ups every day of testing to know exactly what you're doing. And you're going to have that one client that's like, yeah, just text me when you're done. And they don't talk to you at all for two weeks. And I still go back to this thing, which is what people don't always take responsibility for is, is, is telling people what you expect, right? It, mm-hmm. Like if, if the server's too much, like you can, you can really politely with a smile, ask them to back off or like, we're having kind of a private con. Can you, can, can you come back in like 10 minutes or something? Like yeah, for sure. Help, from, from the customer side, you can manage and make it clear what you need and what you expect. So that's <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. So talking about like the initial steps, we'll talk about the kickoff call just a little bit here. This is your first opportunity as a tester to meet the client. Usually, generally at this point, the client has dealt with someone like CJ or Brian or Heather along the way. But since you're the one that's going to be doing the work, this is your first opportunity to meet that person. So we generally do some brief introductions, go around the horn. Um, it's nice to get to know who they are because they're essentially the ones that are paying your bills, right? Like you're there to do work for them. Um, once you're on that project, your time becomes billable to that client. So you are there to serve that client. And it's nice to get to know those people and meet them. And like, you know, you can pick up pretty quick whether people are like fun and enjoyable, like going to enjoy the engagement, or, you know, we've had kickoff calls where they're clearly doing it and they don't want to. And you can you can feel that energy. I'm a big camera on person on these types of calls. Uh, I studied photo, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. And I think seeing that these little kind of curated windows into like people's lives is is kind of fascinating. I know not everyone's like that but I particularly enjoy it. And I'm also a big believer in the fact that these clients are giving you access to like their network, right? You could potentially become domain admin on that network and have access to all of the company secrets, all of the crown jewels, everything that all the intellectual property, everything that makes that company function. Like that's a lot of trust for them to be placing in you. And I think the least that you could probably do as someone with that trust is, is show your face, give them someone that they know, you know, they know what you look like when you're doing the testing and and, you know, just make yourself available. Um, that's my personal opinion. I know not everyone agrees with that, but that's kind of how I feel about it. And then another thing that was a kind of skill that maybe an art that you learn, um, and I don't have any good advice for, for how to do this, but one of the things we talk about in bars is how do you make someone comfortable that you've never met before within the first few minutes of meeting them, right? Like, how do you present in a way that they feel comfortable and relaxed and engaged and want to be able to talk with you about what you're doing within the first couple of minutes? Um, and like I said, I don't have great specific ideas for how to do that. But I think that's just kind of something to try and keep in mind when you're meeting people on these calls. I got a quick opinion on that. You've got to listen and look and, and, and have your antenna up to receive those signals, whatever they are. And it Absolutely. takes sort of a level of sensitivity. So you've yeah. got to observe. Yeah. And I think part of it too, it's like, like with the camera on, like being an attentive listener, communicating non-verbally that you're listening and that you're attentive and that like you're part of the conversation and, and observing and watching and seeing what they're doing and how they're reacting and all that stuff too. And, and that's why I like the camera on from our perspective. Um, and I, I prefer it for the clients to be on because you're yeah. picking up vi- visual clues. Um, and when you're a bartender, they're right there. You right see there. them frown, <laughs> you see them glance away. It might be a little dark, but... Um, oh, it's no, just you, much harder. You pay hyper attention to that stuff, right? Like you serve a drink and you're watching their face when they take that first sip. And like, that's all informing, like, did they like it? Do they want something different? Like, even if it's not that exaggerated, like you're, you're kind of always paying attention to those visual clues because those are the things that help you anticipate those needs and meet them before the client even really knows that they have them, you know? Yeah. And Ben, is there really a reason for Campari? Oh it's- yeah. I like Campari, but I like, I like the bitter dry stuff. I think it's an acquired taste, like cigarettes or black coffee. But once you acquire it, I'm a I, big fan. I don't like those two combined either. <laughs> press on. Um, so another thing that happens at those kickoff calls is setting, meeting, or setting, managing, and hopefully meeting expectations or exceeding expectations. So as CJ kind of alluded to a little bit before, like that's kind of a back and forth. And depending on what the client needs and wants, like you can you can change those expectations during the course of testing, right? So like some service industry examples, 
like, how do you treat someone that's on a first date? You know, someone shows up early. They clearly don't really know the, each other once the other person shows up. Like maybe, you know, you're a little bit more involved in that table. You're kind of like playing a little bit more of an entertainment role. Like since they're out, in, you know, out on the night or out on the town for the night and like out to have fun, like you're a little bit more lively and engaged and suggesting things and, and stuff like that. Um, versus like someone who comes in by themselves with a book and just knows what they want, knows what they want. And, you know, you ring it in, drop it off and kind of let them be and, and chill and enjoy their meal and drink. Or like travelers from out of town, right? Like if they're new to the neighborhood, do they want recommendations um, and stuff like that? So these are kind of examples of like understanding what those expectations are from like a bar perspective. And then from a consulting perspective, you know, there's a lot of different drivers behind an engagement, right? Like pen tests aren't cheap. And there's a lot of different reasons why organizations will engage with a consulting firm to get a pen test done. You know, are those just compliance drivers? You know, do they just need a box checked? Does this happen every quarter and like you're just the one doing it this quarter? Are you just polishing a floor that's been polished 10,000 times before and they have no interest in even reading what comes out of the report? Is there new infrastructure that's been deployed and the client is interested in kind of testing out that new infrastructure to see how it was deployed or testing like a dev branch before something goes live, something like that? Um, are there internal organizational factors? You know, are, is, is leadership concerned about what a potential breach might look like? And that's kind of motivating them to engage in the test. Is there someone who works in IT that's really pushing to get multi-factor and the CEO just keeps saying, no, we're not going to do multi-factor. So the IT guy reaches out to y'all and says, hey, can we do a pen test where we can show what happens when we don't have multi-factor? And then he can take that to the boss and say, this is what happens. And hopefully you get some ammo to pull levers and get multi-factor implemented in an organization. So all of these kind of different contexts are really important to keep in mind. Uh, one of the things that I also like to ask clients in these kickoff calls is like, what scares you the most when it comes to the security of your organization? Like what, what terrifies you? What keeps you up at night? Like what, what are you worried about? And then kind of keeping that in mind during testing is like something to try and either validate or, you know, kind of reassure the client with, with regards to those fears. You know, are we finding gaps that their tooling is missing that can help alleviate those fears? Are we finding Windows XP boxes that they don't know about for some reason that, you know, are reiterating those fears? But I think those are kind of important to help understand like the expectations that the client has for, for what they need out of the engagement. I also think that empathy and understanding are really important when it comes to these expectations. I've done tests for like hotel chains where we get on a kickoff call and there's like nine people and then midway through testing, it's hard to get a hold of them. We finally do. And it turns out that entire department got furloughed except for one guy. You know, like how do you maintain empathy for someone who had an entire staff of eight and because of one thing or another, now it's just down to one person, you know, like keeping that in mind when you're, when you're kind of going through these is, is really important, I think. Hey, Ben, we had a, a customer comment in here. Victor says, uh, for small, mid-sized business companies that need outside security services, BHIS, Expel, Red Canary, et cetera, are better vendors than the Dell SecureWorks, IBM, Symantec. Talk to that. Like, what do you see as the difference with small, mid-sized and the larger customers? How do you tailor around that? Um, I mean, I think it's a little bit of like that, I don't, I don't want to use like corny phrases, but like you get a little bit more white glove service. I think I know people that work at some of those big accounting or big consulting firms and like you very much are dealing with another very large company. Whereas when we get on a kickoff call here at Black Hills, like you have my phone number. If something goes wrong, you can call the tester at any point in time and I'm going to pick up that phone and be there to, to have a conversation about what's going on. You know what I mean? So I think there's an approachability. I think there's a, a little bit of a level of service that is a little bit more tailored to that specific client. And like maybe a little bit more bespoke if you're going to use a, a bar term to, <laughs> to what that business context is for that, that client and how we can provide value instead of kind of a one size fits all pen test yeah. by a big four kind of firm. Well, I, I think that's kind of similar. The difference between going to back in the day, TJF Fridays, right? Mm -hmm. And go into a classic bar is it's sort of the standards and even like the culture of that organization. Um, and like, oh, yeah, we, we kind of call ourselves boutique and we, there's a lot of boutique pen testers versus the big, what we would call big box. No, but I think absolutely. we sort of pride, pride ourselves and orient around that. And uh, so it's, it's almost just an attitude, but it's the, the culture and the character of, of the service. So I think it's a pride too, a sense of pride too, right? Like if you're a small independent organization, that's like fought hard to get where we are and like do what we do versus like 
being a chain that's kind of got like this corporate backing, like you, I, I feel like there's a little bit more care and intentionality that comes with that being that smaller well, kind of company. Well, and I, I've said that we pick our pen testers. Um, like I said, the, the technical skills is a requirement. There's a baseline there, <laughs> but we look at people like it, that might've been what came through on you, Ben, was the, the bartender background, <laughs> right? Is, is we're looking for a personality and someone that's, you know, how they're going to do. And like, we always look for people who've been in education. Mm-hmm. Right? Because that's one of our bents around it is is that that focus. So there are flavors to different companies. You'll find definite sort of character to different people. So that's yeah, absolutely. So I have a little slide here about how to add value and just kind of a little bit more about anticipating and understanding understanding client needs. I think one way to do that is going above and beyond with deliverables. So I've been on a number of engagements, right, where we turn in a report, but we're also turning in like supporting documents. So we're turning in full scan results. Um, if we're doing some sort of like C2 testing, we're turning in cobalt strike logs and all sorts of indicators of compromise and as much information as we can possibly provide to that client that they can use, you know, so they can take the report and say, Hey, here's what they found. Here's what they did. But if we give them like timestamps of what we did and when they can take that information to a managed SOC and say, okay, which, which of these activities didn't y'all see, you know, what didn't get caught? So I think going above and beyond with with handing off as much of that information as possible really helps the client get as much value as possible out of the the testing that you've done. Not only from like vulnerabilities that you find during the course of testing, but where those visibility gaps exist when it comes to tooling or managed stock services or whatever else is happening. I go back to again like understanding the business context of the assessment. You know, like I have a my my mentor that kind of helped teach me a lot of the stuff early on was used to tell me that we're not really hackers like we I mean we are but when we get hired to do this as consultants we're essentially business or risk analysts risk assessment analysts who just happen to use hacker tools right so keeping that in mind when it comes to to what we're doing and and how we we can be business analysts that just happen to use these these highly technical tools and, and how we can use those to provide value for a client Empathy and understanding made it over to the slide too, and that's okay because it's good to reiterate. And we talked about this a little bit already when CJ asked, but um, so during the course of testing, what it looks like to own your mistakes, right? Like being proactive when things go wrong. Like if you knock a server over, like reach out and call the client. If you send an email and something has gone wrong and you don't hear back, pick up the phone and call the client, right? Like it's always better to err on the side of caution when stuff like that happens and try and establish those, those lines of communication early so that the client isn't the one that has to reach out to you. Because things are going to go wrong. Things always go wrong, especially in the line of work that we do. We do our best to minimize those risks of things going wrong, but it always happens. Um, but what really shows like the character and like the quality of you as a tester and an organization in general is how you handle those things when they go wrong, right? Like how communication works when things go wrong, how you own up to mistakes, how you accept ownership of those mistakes. Um, what you can do to make things right and, and try and fix things. And I think this gets back to the idea of empathy and understanding. But you know, if you do take down a server, that might just be like, oh, well, I was trying to exploit this host and the server went down. I don't know what to do. Move on to the next thing. But in reality, that server going down for that client might make someone have to go in and work over a weekend to try and get that stuff back up online. So understanding that and kind of keeping that in mind will really help, I think, taking charge of owning those mistakes and kind of make things go over smoothly when, when things do go wrong, because they always go wrong. Um, and then lastly, like what are lessons learned, right? Like what, what did we learn from things going wrong that we could be better about next time? You know, were we password spraying too quickly that we locked out an entire domain, right? Like did we use an exploit that it said it was unstable and we probably shouldn't have tried it, but we tried it anyway because we really wanted that shell. And now we know we're never going to use that exploit again. Like what, what can we take away from those scenarios that we can try and use to improve the work that we do and make sure that things like that don't happen again in the future? Nope. Real quick on that. Our thing is when things go wrong, um, text and email are probably not bad. When there's emotion, we just, we have a set of business rules. And one of them is about when things go wrong, you want to, you, there's a, there's a, a laundry list of communication methods. And the best one for empathy and all that stuff is like, like we said earlier, be on camera or, or the phone, right? The phone yeah. is next. When things are complex, when things are crazy, we've all done 50 emails back and forth. What <laughs> happened? Like, that's just freaking ridiculous. Someone but, else gets added to the chain and then jumps yeah, over. And then, you know, it's, it, it, it just sometimes they're too long. Like, no one has time. I don't have time to read 50, 50 items in a thread. Um, but Ben, here's a, here's a couple of questions from an anonymous attendee. Uh-uh. Um, why should we hire your company where almost everyone submitted similar proposals? 
You want to take that one? <laughs> so it's what you said. Well, you know, yeah, they're all serving. They all sent you a bar menu and you can get a Manhattan at all of them. Yeah. And, but there is a difference and we don't, I don't think we win a lot of anonymous proposals. When people are putting out an RFP and 50 companies are applying, we're not going to win them. We win them when, when, one, when people know us or they've heard about our work. So the reputation of that bar, Mm -hmm. you know, look at all the menus, all the menus are online, but you go to your favorite bar over and over. Oh, for Um, sure. So uh, there's just so many parallels in that. So I think reputation you. goes a long way too. And I also like, I don't have a lot of visibility into like what responding to RFPs looks like and like how those business decisions gets made when it comes to like selecting a pen test firm. So I, I want to jump in on this one because I think it's really appropriate. So CJ, something we used to talk about a lot when people would ask is what's your differentiator is the <laughs> science and the art, right? So, and this, this is even doubly more true within, within bartending, within, within mixology, right? Is there's a, you know, you can go and you can order a, uh, like, uh, vodka cranberry at the bar and you're going to get alcohol and it's going to get you where you want to go, hopefully, <laughs> right? Or, you know, but there's also like, that's your well drinks. That's going to cost you like four fifty, five fifty, six bucks. But then you go and you can look on the menu at nice places and there's like a $12.50 cocktail that is like all of these amazing, wonderful concoctions and mixes. And you're going to have much more of an experience. You're going to get a lot more out of that. It's a lot more than just the consumption of the alcohol. It's a lot more than just checking a box on a pen test and just getting a report. Sometimes there's an art form to be done with a lot of this stuff. So that's that's the big differentiator that we like to talk well, about. And, and, with, and our differentiator for our company is Ben. <laughs> yeah. Ben is our differentiator in a whole bunch of Ben. So that's what we say. We say pen testing is a science and an art. It's like Brian saying the vodka. Yes, it's it's Smirnoff vodka or it's or it's Grey Goose vodka. The vodkas are the same. But you've got Ben who's taking the shaker and flipping it around his back and catching it. Why setting he's wearing crazy beer goggles? Yeah, setting stuff on fire. Everyone's that's, having a good time. Make it fun. <laughs> um. So we kind of talked about kickoff calls and like starting the engagements, managing expectations and all that stuff, owning mistakes. That's kind of in the middle. I really do think that if you set expectations at a reasonable level and understand client expectations at that kickoff call, a lot of things can go wrong in between testing, but a lot of those things are easy to fix um, during testing. So that kind of brings us to the end of testing is closing out an engagement. Um, so first and foremost, obviously, prompt delivery reports. Um, earlier is always better. You know, over over promise or under del- under promise over. You know what I mean? Under promise, over deliver. There we go. <laughs> so earlier is always better. Um, I kind of talked a little bit earlier about the analogy of finishing a meal and having to wait like another twenty minutes for the bill just to pay, and kind of how that colors and sours the evening. And then the report readout. So this is kind of the the bookend when it comes to like the initial call of meeting the client, this is going over everything that you found during the course of testing, giving a chance to kind of speak to the work, giving the client a chance to ask questions, going through the report, being a general resource. Um, a lot of times clients will say, well, hey, we really like this. Can you send us a list of these things? So there's an opportunity to kind of follow up with deliverables, like edits to the report, um, list of affected hosts, and things like that. So this is also super important. Um, and a big thing, I kind of talked about this a little bit or alluded to it a little bit earlier, but like not being afraid to say that you don't know, right? Especially for me coming into this with one or two years of experience, it was really hard to do these report readout calls where clients had been IT administrators for 15 or 20 years and would ask me highly technical questions that I don't know about because no one knows everything about security, right? And so not being able, not being afraid to say like, look, I, I don't have a good answer for that, but you know, I'll consult with my resources, I'll consult with colleagues, I'll do some research, I'll find out that answer, and I'll get back to you. And I think being able to say that is, is super important, because you're not going to know everything all the time. I, I certainly do not. So with that being said, um, here's a couple like random just kind of slides about observations in general. Being behind a bar was a lot like being on stage. People are just kind of staring at you all the time. Um, you're not necessarily like the entertainment. They're not coming there to stare at you, but you're kind of part of the establishment, right? You're, you're part of the scenario that these people find themselves in. Um, so things like being on your phone, touching your face, how you're holding yourself, whether you're looking bored, whether you're looking busy, all of these things are super important. And in the consulting world, you know, I would call those optics if we're going to use business buzz terms, but presenting well in consulting is also incredibly important, right? Having a nice webcam, 
um, having a nice microphone, looking good, sounding good, having good internet, especially if you're only going to be doing this stuff remote and you're never going to be on site meeting with someone, you know, calling in with, with terrible audio quality and sounding like trash is not confidence inspiring when someone's hiring you to, to, to do expensive work, right? Along that lines, like sharing your window with caution, you know, not sharing your whole screen. I can't tell you how many times clients have shared their whole screen and there's all sorts of information on there that I shouldn't be seeing. You know, I, I said it earlier, but I've got a folder on my desktop that says memes and I have a folder that says top secret and everything goes in those two folders, regardless of what it is, instead of just getting dumped on desktop. So if I do accidentally share a desktop, which I try very hard not to, then there's not going to be any sensitive client information that gets disclosed. Um, we talked about it a little bit already earlier too, but visual indicators that you're listening, being an active listener, nodding your head, smiling. Obviously, I'm not. Don't force it. Don't make it fake. But you know, act, you know, enjoy enjoy your conversation and, and be engaged in the talk. Another thing I want to talk about, and I think BB probably talks about this a lot more in, in his reporting stuff, but the kind of the idea of of narrative and constructing narratives and how we use narratives to convey information in a more entertaining and engaging and meaningful way. So one of the, the classic examples I have from a bar is talking about selling a glass of wine, right? So you could say, hey, our special wine tonight is red by the glass. It's really tasty, kind of dry. It's eight bucks. Or you know, you can tell a story about the wine. And specifically with wine, people love to tell stories about vineyards, who owned the vineyards, what the crops were like that year. But you know, our, glass, our wine by the glass tonight comes from a family-owned producer in Napa. Uh, their last vineyard was destroyed by the wildfire. This bottle is from their last remaining stock as they work towards rebuilding their family legacy, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the story behind everything is it gets people interested and engaged. And by someone purchasing that glass of wine, they've become part of that story, right? Like they're now part of that narrative that they heard and that narrative is continuing by them, you know, engaging and enjoying that wine. So the idea of narrative driven technical reporting, how do we make those technical reports digestible? How do we tell a story? You know, how do we provide something that's not just a, you know, a blob of scan output, but like a narrative driven methodology of things that we found interesting, paths that we went down, things that an attacker would probably do? Like, how do we show those thought processes in a report? And, um, and I think delivering findings that way, you know, even to non technical clients, like that's something that they can get really engaged in and it's interesting and fun to read. And ideally, I think a pen test report should be fun to read. I enjoy writing the ones that I do, especially if you have good findings. And I think even if you don't necessarily know what, what's going on 110%, I think those reports should be somewhat enjoyable enough to read that people want to read them or else they're just going to, you know, throw it in a folder and not look at it or just scrape out, you know, the actionable findings that they need and kind of never really go through the rest of it. And I think with that in mind too, like for non-technical folks, like how do you communicate things in a non-technical manner that they can understand? How do you translate highly technical findings into digestible bites? And John likes to say what levers can be pulled. How do we talk about what levers can be pulled within an organization to fix things? What does it mean for, for that client's business, right? So some of this should inspire you because usually the people who contract with us, like we go through their acquisition people and then the tech people are the people that requested us to begin with. Um, but you, you always have customers, whether it's the IT department or the board of directors or whoever. And, and our stuff is to help you inspire you to tell your story to the board, right? And if you need help doing that, if the report's not getting there, this is another case of ask, hey, you guys got a special dessert? <laughs> Can you make a big flashy <laughs> presentation? Can you set my dessert on fire and give it to the board? Like, <laughs> we will do, we will, like, we've, we've, this is an open offer. If, if you want us to come to the board just to be a prop for you to ask questions to, or how do I, you know, ask for specific advice? Hey, hey, Ben, how do I, how do I couch this curb roasting thing is a win that, that we, yes, we had curb roasting, but how, how do I turn that into a win mm -hmm. that you guys curb roasted me? Like, well, we had to jump through many hoops and it was only two accounts. And, you know, so take, take how we're presenting in storytelling and use that within your organization as well. Because we all deal with the eighth, ninth layers, of the seven layer model, <laughs> and politics and then the organization. So, yeah, that's a really good point. No, I like that. Um, cool. So I have a couple more like kind of random assorted things I wanted to talk about. Uh, this was something that was told to me when I first started working in like fine dining restaurants by a, an acclaimed chef here in Chicago. And he told me the most important person, most important position in this whole restaurant is the dishwasher. It doesn't matter how many accolades the chef has. It doesn't matter if plates aren't getting cleaned and food can't go out. 
then literally nothing else matters. Um, I think this is kind of, kind of something to keep in mind in general, just to be humble with your work. Don't be too proud to get your hands dirty and do grunt work, whether that's helping out with things that you would rather not do, like managing Office 365 tenants or anything like that. Like, Don't be too proud to, to help do the grunt work and get your hands dirty and, and help the business function. Another big takeaway from working in bars is develop healthy coping mechanisms. The service industry is, is very well known for having a lot of substance abuse issues. There's a lot of readily accessible alcohol, um, drugs, and things of that nature. I think coming out of that and learning to how to have healthy coping mechanisms, like going for a run, finding a therapist, reading books, doing things to cope with problems in a healthy way is a life skill that will probably save your life if you don't have one already. And then, so this is kind of the, the main impetus for this talk was... Um, it's from a speech called A Letter to a Young Bartender, which was given by Jackson Cannon. And this was given at Tales of the Cocktail in like 2015 or 2014. I'm not exactly sure when. Tales of the Cocktail, if you're not familiar, is essentially like DEF CON uh, for mixology and bars. It takes place in New Orleans once a year. Uh, but this was a speech that he gave. This is just part of it. If you're interested in reading the whole thing, you can look it up. There's some more interesting parts of it too, but I kind of pulled out the part that I liked and it says, you will not have to map your route to your destination. You will be guided. All of the people you work with from now on will be your guide to the destination you have chosen. If you're clear about what you want, are truthful, and people ask you what you want, and make yourself humble and available to guidance, you will reach that destination. And I think this, this kind of like brings to mind the cycle of like observing someone do something, you doing it yourself, you being observed while you're doing it, and putting yourself out there and kind of constantly getting better. Right, Because everything that we do in our lives, every single job that we've worked has something of value that we can learn from, Right, whether that's you know, working in a bar and learning that you don't want to work in a bar or working in a bar and like learning how to talk to people. Like Every single job has something like that that you can take away from it to make yourself better personally and professionally and improve as you kind of go through life. And I know that's like high platitudes, um, but I would recommend looking up and reading the speech. It's, it's pretty moving. And then last but not least, just kind of a quick side about transferable skills. Um, this is just my experience personally, but I would say anywhere between, I would probably adjust these percentages, but 60 to 65% of the job is using soft, soft skills, relatively basic concepts. Um, communication, managing your time effectively, self-managing your time, especially if you don't have a manager constantly checking in and micromanaging you, working hard, writing, speaking, all those things. Those are kind of universal skills, right? I would say the remaining like 35 to 40% of the job is the technical stuff. And all of that stuff can be learned. And it's often hard to learn that stuff, but it's not impossible. So if you're interested in kind of getting into the field in general, I think this is, this is what I found from my experience coming from not doing this to doing this. As far as learning these things, I don't have fantastic solutions. I would say, you know, be observant, be empathetic. This is a joke about picking up a part-time job at a coffee shop or bar. I have a lot of people that I know that have done kind of stand-up and improv classes just to try and be better at being quick-witted and engaging in conversation and, and rolling with punches and things like that. And finding a good therapist, finding good like balance, mental health balance in your life will help you be more available and open and empathetic and understanding and you know, accepting of feedback and willing to learn and grow and become better. And then last but not least, um, I did include one slide. This was my favorite drink to make and drink. Well, this is, a, this is kind of a two-part. Often, if I was busy and stressed and in the weeds and people would ask me what my favorite drink was or my favorite drink to make was, I would say a beer and a shot because that is also pretty accurate as well. But if I'm going to take my time and, and make something well-crafted, the Jungle Bird was one of my favorite drinks. So there's a little bit of history about the Jungle Bird from the Aviary Bar in Kuala Lumpur. As CJ mentioned earlier, it's got some Campari, a little bit of bitterness to kind of balance out the kind of cloying sweetness of pineapple juice and, and all that stuff that you would find in tiki drinks. So it's usually made with blackstrap rum, which is not my favorite. It's kind of the byproduct of the sugar making process, usually dark and bitter. So kind of sub in something funky with a little bit of sweetness like China to emulate that. But this is probably one of my favorite drinks to make and definitely one of my favorite drinks to drink because it's it's got that fun kind of funky fruity flavor going on, but a little bit of dryness from the Campari to kind of balance it out and make a, a well-rounded, enjoyable beverage. You convinced me. I'm going to try it. <laughs> What's the time? Uh, 51? Not bad. You, you, yeah. the, the, the hamburger is ready. You, you, you spotted that. Exactly <laughs> uh, so the thing about this webcast today, and one of the reasons that when Ben was like, hey, can I, you know, what about this? Or can I do it? I was like, absolutely. And, it, and it's because 
you can have all the skills in the world. If you don't have these skills, like it doesn't all, you gotta like be able to round it out. And same thing with like, you could have a ton of education, but you don't know how to job hunt. You can't get the job. Like it all goes together. And so sometimes we do very technical talks. Sometimes we do the soft skills talk. Sometimes we do the blue team talks, the red team talks. Like we're trying to hit you every single week as a well-rounded human being. So that way you can do the thing that you want to do. Uh, so we I have to go back here. real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Ben. So I, I talked earlier about, I don't have a lot of fantastic ideas for getting better at this, but one of the ways you can get better at this is by doing things exactly like this and giving talks and giving presentations and submitting CFPs and things like that. Um, it's especially easy when the world's remote and you do it at home. It's just one more meeting that you do. I have no idea how many people are here. I'm intentionally hiding that information from myself. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's a little bit more approachable in a way to kind of get into doing this type of thing without getting up on stage in front of 200 people and trying to give a talk for the first time. That's a great point. It's uh, also the reason that we do pre-show banter is because it feels like we're just talking to each other. And then all yeah. of a sudden we're like, here's a presentation. And we don't know that there's <laughs> a thousand people or 2000 people. Because... <laughs> If you think about those people in a room, you're like, that's intimidating. But if a thousand or two thousand people are watching online, you're like, eh, it's fine. It's just, it's just us. It's just us here. Good. All right. Uh, so, any questions, Corey? Do you see any questions, comments, or anything you want to add on? I have a cute dog. That's my main feedback. Thanks. Uh, I left the door open in my office, hoping she would sneak back in, but she's probably upside down on the couch. So, I use a Discord. A lot of people I have cute dogs. <laughs> I saw Fletch answering a couple questions. Fletch, did you want to elaborate on any of those? That's a no. That's a no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Someone asked the if there was going to be jungle birds in uh, Deadwood. That, that was going to be my question. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. We're going to have a, gonna have a mixology class. Yeah, there's Could, plantation OFTD, which sounds like a vulnerability to me. So Yeah, well, old-fashioned traditional dark. You should probably no. pre-make a couple of gallons of this just for preparation. Oh, yeah, <laughs> baby. <laughs> I, I'm willing to help. I'm willing to volunteer <laughs> my services with the tumblers. There's no vodka and there's no cranberry in this one. Is that okay? That was just what came to my mind, guys. <laughs> People Aren't thought you? they had reconned you when you threw that out there. No, no, they did. <laughs> there's a reason that was just what came to his mind. <laughs> nothing uh -oh. is nothing is an accident. What's wrong with vodka cranberry? Let's say that was. What's wrong with vodka cranberry? Nothing. It just says something about you. Dude, it does. There, there's a bar in DC called Bar Mini, which is a Jose Andres bar, and it's an experience. Like every drink takes like 15 minutes to make, and you wait and you watch, and it's an incredible experience. And then like stuff, they got like dry ice and smokes coming out of it, and every the ice is specific to this drink, and the container is specific to this drink. And so when you were talking about like, I feel like we're that when it comes to pen testing, red teaming, threat hunting, and active song. Isn't there also? I've heard of a bar where, or I don't know if it's like it's a calf bar half psychic where like they just ask you one thing they're like tell me what was your childhood nickname and then they like then, oh. and then like you answer and then they pick a drink for you that's like supposed to be perfect for you based on that like so it's like half psychic half I would, bartender i wouldn't i wouldn't want to tell people you know that what though that it almost sounds like uh you know those quizzes that they use to harvest people's like like what what, what street did you grow up on mm -hmm. what's the name of your first girlfriend <laughs> what's the name of your what's what was the name of your first pet it's like what was your mother's maiden name what's your social security number yeah but as okay. we've learned <laughs> so, people will happily trade that information for a drink <laughs> like <laughs> which beetle am i who <laughs> Well, Ben, when you were a bartender, was that like a standard question? Like, hey, what street you grow up on? What was the no. first name? We yeah. used to, my favorite was people would ask me my name when you were working with them. Like, hey, what, hey, real quick, what's your name? And I would tell them and they'd be like, okay, thanks. And just turn around. And that's like, cool, 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 cool. So not going to tell me your name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we don't seem to have any questions, but a lot of people saying thank you for giving this presentation because they're either trying to make the transition into information security or um, it was just good. To, to cover the topics. So. There aren't any current questions, but uh, CJ's question, uh, just maybe go back and look and uh, identify kind of a pattern. There were people who, multiple people who asked, you know, how transparent are you during engagements? How much do you interact? Uh, and that's up to the customer. Uh, but 
we take great pride in, in uh, being as interactive as you want. Uh, for example, Corey and I were just on an engagement where uh, we spent the entire engagement on Microsoft Teams and kind of gave uh, the organization a heads up anytime we were doing anything or uh, just followed up with them. Hey, we did this thing. Did you guys see it in the event that they you know, didn't respond within uh, what we would expect uh, to be uh, a, a reasonable alerting time frame? Yeah, there's there's restaurants where they cook it right in front of you, you know, like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what we were doing. We were doing all the flair. We were flinging eggs at each other and, and, and you know, all the fun stuff. I got to say that that can go too far for us. So we were doing the U.S. Congress. Well, and we, uh, we, we can say it. We can, we say can it. disclose oh, yeah. that because <laughs> it's, it's, public, it's public realm. All right. All right so <laughs> Brian Furman was doing this and they, they wanted a, a screen remoted to a conference room. So I think he was on a two week or something like that. He's in the middle of the second week. He's been hacking for two, almost two weeks. And he's just sitting there and he's in his dark room. You can picture him in the hoodie and the whole thing. And all of a sudden, this disembodied voice comes over his speaker. What are you doing now? He said, he just <laughs> scared the crap out of him. But they had a screen up. He just remoted his screen so that they would they could look in on it or whatever. But we've we've had customers who like say, hey, we want you to do this on site. And on site is, is it, this is a kind of performance art where it's kind of like watching you paint. Hey, watch while I Google this. Corey's, Corey's almost got a stand-up routine about how he hacks. <laughs> He's like, I don't know. I don't know. I'll Google this. I'll Google that. I, I try this. It's really boring to watch. The story, the report is way better. Right. But we will, we will tailor it to what the customer wants. Um, Some people you, want the, you know, they want to know how lap? the sausage is made. It's not pretty yeah. always. You know, no, it's, it's the equivalent not. of it's like... <laughs> You know, if you if the Gordon Ramsay kitchen nightmares, you might find out that oh, there, you know, this is the uh, this is the database we've been using for usernames that's uh, ten years old and hasn't been updated. <laughs> yeah. But there's uh, veins in my hack. How did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, every once in a while, we have a production company that reaches out from like one of the TV networks that says, "Hey, we want to make a TV show about hackers. You know, can we, you know, film what you're doing?" And I was like, it's not going to be, in, it's not going to be interesting. Like it's <laughs> not, uh, when, no, whatever no, no, you think not, it's going to be, it's not. That's not the answer. The answer is how much are you willing to pay? <laughs> <laughs> now he's in sales all of a sudden. I will <laughs> say new media, right? I mean, the truth is that new media has unlocked the potential for long form, super boring content to, I mean, there are people that yeah. watch. 24 hour pre show banter con. <laughs> <laughs> there are people that watch, uh, you know, someone on Twitch build a keyboard for eight hours or, or, you know, slowly do speed runs of the same level of the same game again and again for like 24 hours. Um, you were so talking about now, the people who pay to watch people sleep and then wake them up. <laughs> I mean, so right. seriously, like if, if, if we pen test, you know, if we do a pen test for Twitch and they want us to stream it on Twitch, I'll do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, think, yeah. I, I think it's good that you know we we do offer that flexibility because I mean there's some customers that goes the other way too. They're like, I don't want to hear from you until yeah. until right. Yeah, yeah, just yeah, yeah. Well, it's what, it's what it's what CJ and I were talking about just yesterday too. It's like sometimes like the testers we have some people like some testers they prefer it's like slip me what I need to do underneath the door. And then two weeks later, I'm going to slide a report back on the <laughs> and don't talk to me again. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, it, is, it has been an hour. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. We enjoyed spending time with each other and you. Uh, also, if you get a chance, come visit us at Wildwoods Hack and Fest or at another conference that we're sponsoring. If you ever need a red team thread hunt, active sock or anything like that, you know where to find or us. Or do you just want to talk? Yeah. If you just want to talk. Ben, any you final thoughts? DJ. Oh, thanks for thanks for being here. I appreciate y'all. Thanks, Ben. It was an awesome talk. Good job, Ben. Thank yeah, you. good job. Ben. Yeah, way to bust yeah, the glass, nice. Ben. <laughs> All right, Ryan, go ahead and kill it with fire, my friend. Kill it with fire. Oh, wait, no, I think it's me. I think I have to do it. Oh, oh, I you have were to it. do it. Oh, geez, I'm the Ryan. <laughs> He's talking here. to himself in third person and referring to himself as Ryan. For All right, Ryan. Jason, go ahead and kill that. Okay, Jason, I'm killing it now. <laughs>